Welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2019. We're here with more indie games thanks to the Indie Mix. I'm Callie. I'm here with Jake Decker and Fred Schreiber from 3D Realms, Vice President of 3D Realms, and Executive Producer on Wrath, Eon of Ruins. So that's what we're going to be playing today, right? Absolutely. Um, so tell us a little bit about this game. I'm getting uh, pretty intense Quake vibes, and I understand that's on purpose. Yeah, actually, so... Uh... So Wrath is uh, what you could call almost a spiritual successor to the type of game that Quake was back in the day. Mm -hmm. So the game itself uh, is made by what we call the Quake scene veterans. So since Quake came out, there's been a huge community of fantastic Quake mappers. They still make fantastic maps and mods today. And when we, uh, when we wanted to do the next game at 3D Realms, we reached out to one of these guys. Uh, he had a small studio called Kill Pixel, and he was actually working on a game called Wrath. Mm -hmm. It looked and felt exactly like something that we would love to work on as well. So we partnered up with, uh, with Kill Pixel. We uh, found a bunch of fantastic community guys who you know, never stopped making maps for Quake, asked them to help us out on this fantastic new title, and uh, yeah, here it is, Wrath. So tell us a little bit about the engine. Sure. My understanding is that it's uh, not quite new. Well, so so the engine it's based on the original Quake engine, mm -hmm. uh, but this uh, this right here, the uh, Wrath, is uh, based on a source port called Dark Places. Mm -hmm. um, numerous reasons for it. You know, if we were to make a game in the very original engine, uh, there were a lot of limitations that would simply just limit what we want to do with the gameplay of the game. Um, so we still wanted to stay relatively authentic, but also not limit ourselves too much because it's. You know, it's 2019. You still right. need to be able to do certain things, and we also wanted to make much larger maps than were uh, people were used to in a game like Quake, for instance. So this is just like 2019 take on the classic that we remember playing in the 90s. Exactly. So, uh, so in Wrath, you play as uh, someone called the Outlander, mm -hmm. and uh, and the game takes place uh, shortly after you, uh, you, uh, you you're you're drifting on what's called the Ageless Sea, and you end up on this uh, this island. And you're met by uh, this angelic figure mm -hmm. called the uh, the Wayward of uh, Shepherd, uh, the Shepherd of Wayward Souls, and uh, this uh, this figure basically tasks you with uh, with destroying the guardians who uh, who are roaming this world. Mm -hmm. And uh, from then on, you uh, you basically go through 15 levels spread out in uh, in three. Uh, hubs, as we call them, or three worlds. Uh -huh. um, each of these worlds, you can visit the levels in uh, in almost any order you'd like. So it has some slight Metroidvania elements to it, as in you can visit the two first levels in the first hub uh, in any order you'd like. And in order to gain access to the third level, you have to finish either one of the first two, and so on. Okay. Um, once you've finished all uh, five levels in a uh, in a hub, you uh, you get to the boss of that hub. Gotcha. Okay, those things were pretty scary. They have, like, Absolutely. completely that, open jaws. That blade looks very satisfying, though. Yeah, I so was messing around with it, doing that charge dash and, exactly. like, cutting through four or five of them. So this right here is called the Ruination Blade. It's the first weapon uh, of, of Wrath. So with this blade, you have uh, a lot of new movement abilities. So, for instance, you can jump, dash forward, but you can also use it to gain access to new secret areas. For instance, over here, if I were to jump here, I wouldn't be able to get to it. Mm -hmm. But if I use my uh, my secondary fire mode here of the blade, as you see here, I can oh. actually get over oh, here. Oh, cool. So it's also helping with traversal. Exactly. So this right here is what we call the artifacts. And artifacts is a brand new thing for, for a game like this. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of call them consumables as well. So this first artifact here is called the soul tether. And what we wanted to do in, in Wrath was to do an alternate take of what is considered a game mechanic as saving. So in Wrath, when you pick up the Soul Trailer, you can place it at any point in the game, and that will uh, serve as your respawn point. Oh, so when cool. you die, you'll respawn at your Soul Trailer. You'll pick up plenty of those throughout the level, so it's basically up to you uh, where you want to feel safe. You can compare it to the Bonfire and Dark Souls games, but you can place it yourself. Oh, okay, cool. So it all of a sudden becomes a mechanic rather yeah. than something you just spam every few seconds uh, in order to save all the time. There are also uh, traditional checkpoints in the levels as well, mm -hmm. uh, called shrines, where you'll also get uh, different items and so on. So the Soul Tether, is there like an element of strategy? Like, could you just really like screw up placing a Soul Tether and be in a terrible situation? Or is it more like 
okay, I think I'm about to go into a fight I'm not ready for. I should probably Ex place the soul tether. Exactly. So, you know, if you see a bunch of enemies come towards you, it might be a good place. If yeah. you can, you know, traditionally in old school first person shooters, if you get to a place where there are a suspiciously uh, a large amount of weapons and ammo and med kits, you know, okay, <laughs> something something coming. Something's coming, coming yeah. yeah. So here I picked up the life siphon. Um, again, we wanted to connect everything in the game to the player's action. So instead of having a, like a traditional med kit where you retreat from the action and use a med kit, mm -hmm. we have something called the life siphon. When you activate the life siphon, you're actively sucking a, a health out of the enemies you kill. So right now it's active, and every time I kill an enemy here, I get the health from that enemy. Oh, cool. And that's in the bottom left. Exactly. So it, it actively forces me to enter the, the action in the game rather than retreating from the action and just you know, using a medkit, for instance. So keeping up that kind of, like, you know, the, the momentum that you're used to in something like Quake. Exactly. So right here, uh, you can see there's a big red door and there's a red key here, you know, and we try to connect everything in the level design, obviously. Uh, so if you see a red door, you can usually also see how to get to there relatively easy. Uh -huh. This right here, though, is not that easy to get to. <laughs> Also, this right here is a large spanning outdoor area. This was not possible in the original Quake engine, and one of the reasons why we wanted to go for a more updated version. But mm -hmm. the visual aesthetics of everything uh, is still built within the same boundaries as you'd expect from the from the mid 90s. Yeah, right. You see, like the, the the way the textures are, the way the edges of things exactly are more classic, but it seems like there's a lot more possible. So Even every, like, everything is basically handmade, hand paid pixel art, uh, just as they did it back in the day. Right. Are there any cool guns that we can check yes. out in this? Uh, so right here, so this guy, if I get too close, he'll explode, but I ran out of ammo, so uh, see here, I'm, I'll I'm stab down anyway. to, Yeah, but I have a life siphon, but uh, oh, over here, I'll show you guys a new gun. So this right Ooh. here is our shotgun, the bread and butter of any first person shooter. Mm -hmm. So this right here is our shotgun. It's a double barrel shotgun. It has two fire modes, it has regular fire mode, a huge blast radius, and the secondary fire mode is a charge up that could ricochet off walls. Whoa. This is really good for oh, crowd cool. control in this game. That's super cool. So right here is a really good place for me to use my life siphon and start blasting through some enemies. They really just like break apart too. Yeah, the gore in this apart. game is also something that uh, was pretty hard to do in this way back in the 90s. Right. Um, something that we really spent a lot of time uh, tweaking and making really satisfying a game like this. Mm -hmm. So these guys dropping these blobs right here is, are called the afflicted and they basically pull out a piece of their own body and throw at you. They're oh basically God. walking explosive barrels so you need to get a, a, you know, pretty far away from them before you kill them if you don't want to take any splash damage. And, and of course, if you get close to them, they'll like charge at you as well. Oh, jeez. Could you use them to like take out a group of enemies that are around them too? So yeah. Explode? So if he is in between a group of enemies, it's a really good idea to aim for him first. Mm -hmm. So right here, I'm getting swarmed by a lot of enemies. The game it has a pretty high difficulty mode. So, you know, we, we expect people to have a challenge. It's not an unfair game. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you could, in some ways, compare it to, uh, you know, we've seen uh, previews mention that this is, feels like the Dark Souls of first person. <laughs> it's, not an, you know, it's not an inaccurate description of the game. I think I'm actually going to die here. Are there, are there difficulty options, or is there just one flat difficulty? There, there, there will be diff uh, different difficulty options in the game. So I know right, right over here there's another soul tether. Really, really good place to actually use that mm -hmm. right now because I'm in, uh, I'm in trouble. But over here, I'm going to get a brand new weapon. As you can see, I'm starting to pick up new ammo types here. Uh -huh. These are fangs, basically teeth from enemies. And there is an enemy I killed earlier in this game called the Widow uh, where half the body is just made out of teeth. And when they die, they drop teeth. So Those very scary looking ones, yeah. Exactly. So that's another way of us, of us trying to basically connect the, uh, the enemies in... Oh. I died, Dead. but I, you know, I just saved. To connect the enemies to the weapons you use in the game. So we're going to get a gun that fires teeth soon, is what you're saying. Oh, yes. <laughs> Coming up right over here. So first of all, so oh, see, when man. you die, you can select whether you want to return to a shrine or a soul tether, and I want to return from a soul tether here. Mm -hmm. So let me first take care of these guys over here, because there's a big bunch of them just waiting for me. Is uh, it... Do you need to spend a lot of time on an ammo con conservation? Uh, like, will that be an issue? Uh, sometimes and sometimes not. Uh, it depends, of course, on how good you are with the ruination blade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually think that uh, I have some... The way, like, having fangs as an ammo type reminds me of, like, you know, like, in 
Jim. Know, let me let me just quickly cheat here a bit so I can actually. Ooh, show you developer some, magic. <laughs> some some few things over here. Uh, Got yeah, myself into a corner here. It reminds me of like in Doom 2016 how you need to kill enemies to get ammo exactly. and that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. So this is a very satisfying place to use the ruination blade here. Oh, here we go. All right. You make so, quick work of those with yeah. the ruination blade. So right here is what we call the fang spitter. Oh. And of course it does what you expect. It, yeah, I was going to say, I think I got a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like a Gatling, but with It's a Gatling teeth. gun, yeah. The secondary fire mode shoots multiple fangs at once at a lower fire rate. So you can decide, you know, do you want the, the fast, more accurate fire rate? Uh -huh. Or do I want more uh, more power and more damage output, but a slower fire rate? So is there anything else that separates this from the older games that you've been able to do with new tech? Because I know, looks-wise, you want to try to keep it the same, but what else maybe under the hood that people wouldn't notice that you wouldn't have been able to do years and years ago? Absolutely. So, so besides just the vast levels and the different weapon types we have, there's also all of the different ways the items work in the game. Something very unique that hasn't been seen in you know such an old game. This is effectively, you know, an old game released in 2019 with a few tweaks. Uh -huh. uh, so we do a lot of things uh, also with the enemies and the AI. Uh, you know, the AI in the original Quake. Oh, you're running low on your laptop, by the way. <laughs> you probably should plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, no problem. Let's I think get to the right. Uh, uh, I can barely... There it is. There it there is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, the AI in the original Quake was extremely simple. It's something we're completely rewriting from scratch as well to make sure that you actually have quite, quite, quite more of a challenge playing this game than you would other games. Uh-huh. So All rather right. than just, like, you know, in, with limited technology, you might increase the difficulty just by increasing the amount of enemies, but now you have some more complex ways to increase the challenge for the player. Exactly, and there are a ton of different enemies. Again, all of the enemy designs are somehow connected to what, you, what you're going to do as a player in the game. Mm -hmm. It's something that's very important for us to to make sure that you never feel like in a situation where you have to, you know, duck behind cover. Like, for instance, killing certain enemies like these guys gives you rewards of ammo for a certain weapon. You mentioned, uh, you know, Doom 2016 uh, also has a variation of that, where mm. you know if you go in and do glory kills, you'll get certain uh, certain health items and so on for that. Wait, that looks like a very big, scary man. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'm just there, running a bit quick here to, uh, through this to show you guys some cool things while uh, while we still have time. I've, I've noticed the difficulty does seem to ramp up rather quickly. Like, I only played the first couple minutes, and I was like, all right, it's not too bad. And <laughs> watching this, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, you it, got I, off easy. I can see it, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we also have secret areas in the game, uh, obviously. Uh, we also have what's called coffers. So coffers are basically these chests right here. Uh, oh, your laptop ran out of power. Oh, <laughs> I, was, no. I was sure someone was going to connect it. <laughs> so when someone would connect it. Oh, uh, my I see gosh. them panicking back there. <laughs> well, anyway. No worries. Without showing us, tell us a little bit about the secret areas, because that's yeah, also so like a, you know, a of course, the game mainstay is, uh, of this kind of game. The game is full of, of secret areas. So one way we do of secret areas is, of course, what you expect from classic games. There's a little hint of something on a wall that might be different, a little brick sticking out and so on. You push it, here's secret area. The game has tons of them, but we also have these things called coffers. There's basically uh, t treasure chests scattered throughout the game. And you can find keys for these treasure chests and go back and, and then unlock them. And then there's also uh, this, this Metroidvania aspect to the game where you might get an a, ability or an item later in the game that you can go back and spend early in the game to get access to new secret areas. So we want to make sure that there's a ton of replayability throughout the game. And The Secrets is one thing that 3D Realms especially is very well known for, for our previous games, Duke Nukem 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Prey, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is a key for this game and uh, as well. Awesome. Um, so about when can people get their hands on it and where? So the game will, uh, will come out, uh, we'll, we'll have a version out soon, later this year, that you can play. Um, we haven't announced exactly what that version will be, but we want to get the game into people's hands as soon as possible, because part of developing this, a game like this is also to get a lot of community feedback. This is a game made by us, Killpixel, and the community. And the community is, is such a big part of what makes games like this great. And we, want, we just really want to nail this all the way through. So, oh, hey, we're, we're back. We're up. back. <laughs> we're back. Awesome. So, so that's a big part of it. Um, so we haven't announced a, a date yet, but uh, but later this year you will be able to play Wrath, and uh, and that's all we can probably say right now. 
And is it uh, Steam? Yes, so, so Wrath is coming out for all uh, modern platforms. It's coming out for Steam, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, uh, you know, of course, Steam, PC, Xbox One. Mm -hmm. um, we have the game running on, play, uh, on Switch right now, which is a ton of fun. Uh -huh. Trying to tweak it as well because it's, you know, extremely fast-paced. So, uh, but but it's, it's a ton of fun playing something like this on a platform like the Switch. You know, right. it's something we, we've never thought we'd be able to do, play a handheld Quake engine shooter. It's just something, you know, immensely cool. Yeah. Is, it, is um, it tough getting that aiming right on Switch? Because that is one thing that shooters have seem to have trouble with is the, especially handheld mode, it can be a little exactly, bit tougher to nail that feeling. So a lot of different games do a lot of different tricks on consoles, especially Switch, to make sure that aiming feels uh, really nice. You know, a little aim assist. That yeah, you a little really aim notice. assist and so on. You can, of course, modify and turn everything off if you want to. Um, by the way, uh, here's another new weapon I can just quickly show you before we, uh, before we wrap this up. I if you can pick it up. Glad we have time to see it. Oh, it doesn't want to pick it up right now. <gasps> oh, no! <laughs> Oh, yeah. By the way, before we end here, let me just show you one last uh, really, really cool artifact here. This right here is called the Cruel Aegis. So this is another way where you can trade, uh, for instance, in this time, you can trade health for invincibility. Uh -huh. So let's say you're in a really tough situation, just about to die. You pick up the Cruel Aegis, you instantly use it, you go, oh, you go down to 10 health, uh -huh. but you're invincible for a short amount of time. So, so get as much done in that amount of time as you can. Exactly. So if I didn't have God mode on, this right here would have been a great example where I was basically swamped by enemies. And if I had actually, you know, used this thing, I might have been able to survive. Um, mm -hmm. I also have something here called the Drowner Separatus, uh, which lets, uh, allows me to breathe immersed. Um, there's a section here later in the game where there's a larger auto wander section um, that mm -hmm. you get to right here, where, you know, being able to breathe underwater is it's a really, really Probably hefty item to really have. Really helpful, yeah. Exactly. Um, well, I, I do think we unfortunately have to wrap up. Absolutely. But technical difficulties aside, this was really cool to see as a... Yeah, as I'm a, very excited to play this. It looks like a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, someone who grew up with Quake, I'm really excited. So thank you so much for coming. That was Wrath and of Ruin. Um, don't go anywhere because we do have more indie games coming up for E3 2019. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching.